All righty, folks, we are going to continue the education of a heathen, me, by the one and only Brian Adamson. Brian, what uh, scripture do you have us today? So um, a couple weeks ago, a buddy of mine, we, we had a, a challenge called the Buy Back Your Time Challenge for coaches, consultants, and freelancers. And um, a lot of good things came out of that, that, that challenge that I didn't even see coming. Um, okay. One of which was identifying the fact that coaching is a calling right coaching is a calling i think you and i have talked about that in different ways but that was the first time i had that level of clarity that it's not it's not something that you do it's something that you're called to mm -hmm. which is why the people that are in receipt of whatever services or um help that you're providing they they see it as exactly that you know what i mean it's not a transaction it's actually a way of life and so that that led us down this rabbit hole of just thinking about all the other things associated with that right and the scripture reference popped up matthew 6 and 21 says for where your treasure is there will your heart be also for where your treasure is there will your heart be also which means that the heart follows the pocketbook mm. So where we spend our time says everything about what's on our heart. I mean, I'm sorry, where we spend our money says everything about what's on our heart, which I could also say where we spend our time also says a lot about what's on our heart. And so I think for this time of year, it's extremely important to just consider, although today is Cyber Monday, although Black Friday just passed, and although there's sales every single day going through this holiday season, I'm not saying don't enjoy yourself, but don't enjoy yourself at the expense of yourself. Yeah, I think there's so much in the scripture you're teaching me each and every week that's it's it's hard for me to fathom that this these are thousands of years old. Back to your point about Black Friday, I just got these numbers from Adobe Analytics. We once again set a record. I'm not really sure this is a very good record to have, but nonetheless, we set it. The American consumer spent 10.8 billion dollars in a single day online. That's and let's not forget that we are living paycheck to paycheck. You know, we have heard about the masses not being able to afford a four hundred or a thousand dollar emergency. We have heard about it, it's unaffordable to do this and that. But yet, someday gets deemed Black Friday, and we've got to rip out our credit cards and drop ten point eight billion dollars. I mean, really, really. But but here's the thing, Mike, and it's the saddest indictment to it all because of everything I've mentioned. Right. The people that are making these purchases are those that are not in position to be making them. <laughs> so, what, so what's happening is the, the bulk of the people that are spending during these 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 sales and these holidays are people that's trying to anesthetize the life that they don't want instead of creating the one that they do want. This is what I mean by the heart follows the pocketbook. Right. Yeah. Their heart is more set on buying distractions than fixing the problem. Because if you were set on fixing the problem, your investments would be into yourself versus stuff to make you feel better instead of actually being better. Yeah, there's so much there. I mean, one of the things that I've always thought about, because I, I have this thing called get your money right. And there's a mm -hmm. couple of things that, that I talk about in there. And one of them is this kind of dopamine hit. If you go out and you buy something, you get an instant hit of dopamine. Mm -hmm. However, if you start saving money and living below your means, we all know the goodness is there, but it's weeks, months, quarters, years down the line. It just doesn't hit the same. Said yeah. another way, delayed gratification is a superpower. And yeah. most of us don't have that. The other thing I think about, I think about time all the time. And I'm going to, I'm going to try to get, let's pretend there's like, Brian, do you have a brother or a sister? I do. One of each. All right. So give me your brother's name. Uh, James. James. So we have Brian and James raised mm -hmm. in the same household, into the same environment. And here's the situation. You both make the same amount of money, hundred grand, whatever it is. Let's so say hundred grand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. However, over the last decade or so, you have set your lifestyle up different. James 
has we'll make him the the good son if you will so james lives below his means doesn't carry like any cre- yeah yeah james i'm 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 your boy forget this brian guy you're my boy james <laughs> i kid of course um i don't know who james is but again he's, he sets up his life no credit card debt no student loan debt no car loans you know he lives on half his income and at the end of the day um we'll we'll make it easy math He's putting away twenty four thousand dollars in discretionary income, so two grand a month. Mm-hmm. Then we got our boy Brian. Brian is the party boy. He ever met a, an event he didn't want to go to. He's always the guy buying the rounds. He's the guy you want to be around. He's got three or four credit cards that are nearly maxed out. He went to college for three years, didn't graduate, but got the debt as a present. Um, you know, he rents something that he really can't afford. He leases three cars because two's not enough. And at the end of the day, you know, Brian's negative a thousand dollars a year because he's living on credit cards, right? These are their mm-hmm. two environments. Let's make him negative ten thousand dollars a year. I think that'd yeah. be more appropriate. No, all right, negative. No, screw it. Twelve thousand. It's easier. He's, <laughs> right. Your brother Brian's up twenty-four. You're down twelve. <laughs> yeah. But but here's the deal. Your parents want to go on a 50 year anniversary trip Mm. and they Mm. want you and Brian to come along and it's going to be an amazing trip. It, but it's going to cost you $4,000 flights, hotels, all. but you got to be there. It's your parents 50th anniversary. Your boy, Brian, he could afford that because he's living below his means. Mm -hmm. You probably can get there. But now you're negative 16,000, mm. right? There's sure. just these. And then in my in my thing called Get Your Money Right, I actually convert dollars to time. Mm-hmm. Because in a situation where you're negative, you actually are going backwards. Let's just say you were positive two grand. Let's just say that for a minute. This $4,000 trip for your parents' 50-year anniversary is going to cost you two years. Because mm-hmm. all you have is two thousand discretionary, the event costs four grand. You're going to work two years to attend your parents' fiftieth anniversary. Your boy Brian, he's netting twenty four. He's gonna he's gonna get it done in two months. For sure, right? It's it's For just sure. an entirely different game. Well, it's one of the biggest, and I love that you brought this up, Mike, because one of the biggest reasons that I found that people are stuck is because we believe things that are untruths to be true. For instance, Ben Franklin posted an article in the 1700s, right? About, I think it was the 16 or 1700s, that time is money. We, as a society, has adopted this untruth for hundreds of years now. Never do we stop. One of my mentors says some of the hardest work that people never do is think, right? Mm. And and it's true, we never stop. Oh, that hits, that hits hard. Right. Like because we never stopped to investigate things. We just go along with whatever the status quo is. So to your point, not only is time not money, time is infinitely more valuable than money. However, we spend most of our lives selling a lot of time for a little bit of money. And we wonder why we can't get there, wherever there is. Well, it's it's, it's because you're, you're taking your most valuable commodity and asset and you're selling it for something that's that's worth little to nothing, depending on the day. Yeah, I wish I could remember this. I was listening to Alex Hermosi the other day, and he had he basically went through four categories, and I don't remember all four, but basically the rich by time mm-hmm. and the poor by distractions. Yes. Yes. I mean, I, I heard that and I'm like, nailed it. You nailed it. You you use your time to get money, use your money to get assets, use your assets to get your time back. Exactly. Like that's that's the ecosystem should be. That's the game. Right. But because we hate what we do so much with our time, then we try to buy things to gratify ourselves for that exchange, which is only perpetuating a cycle of staying stuck in that same cycle called the rat race forever. Yeah. I mean, one of the big things I want people to realize is if you could just change your mindset about your job, I hate my job. I hate my job. I hate my job. Well, Okay, if you really hate your job, go get a new one. Mm-hmm. But let's just say those are words because it's cool. Mm-hmm. If you could change your mindset to, hey, my job is the key to my financial future, it's just freeing, right? 
Because for most of us, most of us aren't entrepreneurs. Most of us have to sell time for a little bit of money. But if you see it as a 10-year journey, if you save a little bit of discretionary income, if you become an elite in investor at one thing, you will, in a decade, be wealthy. For sure. For that's, sure. That's it. That's the game. Play the game. Your, your, your job should be your first business partner. Absolutely. If you, if you treat it as anything other than that, you fail going to work every day. If you clock in and clock out for the purposes of being able to support your life and buy stuff, you have failed in this thing called life. Your job should be your first business partner. And if you look at it as such, then to your point, Mike, I think you have a different level of appreciation for it. And not only that, if you valued your time as such, you have a different level of appreciation of that money that you spend your time to get. You're spending your time to get that money. And then what you do with it after the fact. So, so okay. So in this scenario, right, you have us who make money based on our level of skill and creativity. You have others who make money by way of selling their time to make it. Okay. So what happens is you go to work every day. You, you sell your life to get the money. Then you get the money and you go buy the stuff. Say you go buy the house, you go buy the car, whatever. So now they have your money and your employer has your time. Mm -hmm. So you've lost in both arenas. When you and I go buy something at this point in life, we're buying it according to our level of creativity, not from our creativity, because that would mean we will be losing our creativity, but we're not losing it according to our creativity. So we can develop, we could buy an asset, we could uh, we can develop a course or a program. We, we can create a book. We can create assets according to our level of creativity. So watch this. So when we go and develop something, we put the offer out in the marketplace, right? Marketplace buys it. We get the money. And yes, we still go and buy the house or the car. But what we didn't lose was our time nor our creativity, which means that we can replicate that over and over and over again. Exactly. So gaining everything and losing nothing. So when you go back to where we started with for where your treasury is, there will your heart be also. We have to come to a realization that we are our most valuable asset because all of the assets flow from it. So every time you go to spend a dollar, you have to ask yourself, are you feeding your future? Are you feeding your past? Yeah, the, the other the other thing that gets me on this topic is you and I happen to operate at a level in, in know a fair amount of people that are quote unquote successful entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. right? They're, they're in our world. I don't know if it's true for you, but it's true for me. Most of those people, when you get them one-on-one -on -one, and the fans and the aura and the cheers are not around, they tell you they're doing it for their family. And then I ask them, show me your calendar. Facts. <laughs> Family ain't anywhere on their calendar. Facts. Facts. It's just, it's, it is, and I, and, and to me, I, for most of them, if I know them better than a, one conversation, I'm going to, I tell them point blank, your calendar says you're lying. Yeah. And then I yeah. let them see how they react. Yeah. Yeah. We just can't, I mean, it's funny because we were having the conversation yesterday. Um, my daughter, her fiance, and my wife, we were at lunch before we left Michigan. And we were talking about different personality types. And me and your personality type is such that we don't do fluff. Yeah. We have meaningful <laughs> relationships. Like, seriously, like I, we go deep with people, right? We have meaningful right. relationships. It's not surface level. And if we see something, we're going to respectfully call out on it, you know? And it's not to one to, to identify that we're on some type of high horse, right? It's just a function of, if I'm gonna be in close community and relationship with you, I expect that you will call me on something too that seems inconsistent with what I'm saying that it is. Exactly. And um, exactly. I'm I'm grateful to have people like you in my life for that reason. And we and we should call it out. And if it don't land well, then it's like, well, I one thing about me, I never hold people accountable to what I think. I hold them accountable to what they said. Exactly. Exactly. I didn't make this yeah. up. You told me this. You, you, told you know me. what I mean? Yeah, you told me this. So now I'm like, okay, well, let's see the calendar. Does that line up? And yeah. if you if you look at most people's lives, Mike, they're okay with 
I'll give you an example. So I'm in several programs right now um, for my spiritual development, personal development, business development. But it's one mentor, but it's different programs for different reasons. Right. I'm based on what I'm doing in this season. Mm-hmm. And I and I, I found myself getting overwhelmed and or procrastinating for like a couple months and I couldn't figure out why. Right. And for me, that that internally, that bugs me to death. And so I figured out what it was, was that I was waiting for moments to get into the portal and do stuff as opposed to just scheduling it. And I'm like, well, here it is. You go to college and you allow them to institutionalize you, but you won't institutionalize yourself. So guess what I did? I've taken those courses and each day of the week now I've got certain time slots specifically for those. I I created my own college. Right. right. These are my classes. I show up for them at this time. Right. If I don't show up, that's a problem and all the rest of it. And guess what it did? It minimized the procrastination and anxiety because now it's it's a planned event. So I don't have to I, I don't have to think about it anymore. I just have to look at my calendar. Your calendar is your success model. Right. I say all that to say this. How many people allow a job or a career to institutionalize them, but they won't do the same discipline for themselves? Yeah, this rat race is. The first, the first thing about the rat race, I think a lot of people need to do is just recognize it's real. And I say this as somebody who did not recognize it until he was 31. The rat race is real. You, you get in this, you increase your lifestyle. It just makes you run faster on a bigger wheel and you hope to not die before you're 65 or 70. I mean, that's, that's what most people are in. If you can recognize the rat race and then just operate a little different. You just have to carve off what's called discretionary or disposable income. Mm-hmm. Those little chunks of capital will become seeds and those seeds will grow into mighty trees in a decade. Mm. Getting out of the rat race can happen for all of you, right? R- Robert Kiyosaki, for all his nuttiness and craziness of late, he created a board game, Cash Flow. That's amazing. It's like the secret of getting out of the rat race is in that game. Yeah. And everybody can do it. So, um, yeah. But, you know, yeah. I, I'll just add on to that, Mike. The real secret to getting out the rat race is not in that game. It's in your mind. True. Yes. It's you, it's, you have it's to a first, game see it. You have to see yes. it. Yes. That's the key. Yes. Yes. And you have that, you have to see it because it's far too many people that go out here and buy assets. Right. I was one of them when I was. In my early 20s, I had bought 20 properties from 2008 to 10 when the market was compressed. Had I had the right people in my life back then to, to show me what I was doing and really put language to it, I was free back then and didn't know it. But but here's the, here's the problem. Because I, because I didn't, one, acknowledge the rat race, and two, understand that I was in it already, I was just using that as more income to do more stuff. Yeah. That's what that's what I mean by you have to You're get right. free up first. You have to yeah. see it and understand what it is first, because otherwise it just becomes additional money to enhance your lifestyle even more than what you're already doing. Absolutely. You've got to see it. And it trust me, if you play the cash flow game and you don't see it, play it again. Play it again. It should become like techno color. Because again, the the game plays around this little wheel, like a rat, rat race, right? The wheel. And it's not until you're um, passive income exceeds your monthly expenses that you get out to this big rat race. Mm-hmm. You know, you're out of it and you just have all these other things. To me, yeah. that game was like techno color. It's like, yeah. I see it now. Yeah. I can see myself what's, on what's, this little what's wheel. important about that too, Mike, is not only while you're playing the game, studying the game, the thing that you really need to be studying is the social economic difference amongst the players of the game. Yes. That's the biggest piece you need. Cause some of you are out there, you making a quarter million dollars a year, hundred thousand. You probably think that you will get free sooner than the plumber or the janitor. But when you play that game, it's going to completely flip your mind about how you have probably gotten over leveraged in life to where you're going to have to be far more conservative and aggressive and trying to get out of the situation than even the janitor would be. No, I, again, I I've played the game. No kidding. A hundred times, probably more. If you ever wanted to play the game with me, I will let you be the doctor or a lawyer. I will be the teacher or the policeman and I will crush you 
95 yeah. times out of 100. It won't even be yeah. close. Yeah, for sure. For yeah, sure. And I think that's the biggest mindset piece that gets unlocked, Mike. Because you think having more means helps you get out sooner. But typically having more means digs you in further. Absolutely. Well, I appreciate you educating this heathen. I, I really appreciate that we bring a scripture each and every week. If somebody wanted to follow you, how do they do that? Brian Adamson official on Instagram, YouTube, and everywhere else. And also, please, if you guys like these these business these biblical business principles, go check out my podcast, Believers in Business. Um, just started it a few weeks ago. We probably seven nice. episodes deep or something like that. Do the work, right? Like we started it and it was like, I'm just about to put these things out every single week. So if you like this kind of content, you find it helpful, um, you go give us a follow. There you go. I appreciate you, family. Thank you, man.